This is Karen Briggs, violinist, and you're watching Best of Atlanta Concerts TV. This is the lady in red, the infamous lady in red, but you can see it's We're wearing turquoise orange. tonight. But so tonight, yes. Black, tonight, yeah. the black and the turquoise. Yeah. <laughs> However, the reason why she's called the lady in red is because of that astounding performance with Yanni. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Very beautiful, much. beautiful performance. don't know, uh, that video is the second best-selling video to Thriller. So still to this day. Yes, still to this day. I think they're celebrating their 20th anniversary soon on PBS. It was the highest uh, fundraiser for PBS as well. It was amazing. That was an amazing show. Okay. Tell me a little bit about it. Tell me a little bit about just performing in the Acropolis. Well, I still get goosebumps when I think about it because I remember it came together and I didn't really you know, you never know when these things are going to blow up when you do them. I've done hundreds of projects over the years that I've been playing, and that was one of the ones that really blew up really big. It was a big, exciting kind of process in putting it together that involved the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra uh, that came in at the last minute uh, to Greece, to Athens, Greece, where we recorded it. And we had rehearsed for quite a long time worked out every single bug in the music and we just went out there and just performed. You know, it was the orchestra was really kind of sight reading through things. And I don't think they knew that I was coming. Uh, the red dress was made by a wonderful designer named Linda Stokes. There was controversy about it. When we finished the show, the dress was stolen. <gasps> the original dress is somewhere out in the world, maybe in Greece, I don't know. Oh my goodness. I haven't seen it on eBay lately, so. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, it, it just had a lot of, uh, just a big highlight in my career um, as, as a musician. And uh, prior to that, I had always been a, an improvising musician, played a lot of jazz and other stuff, but most people heard of me because of that. And then everything after that was just like, you know, Diana Ross, Stanley Clark, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder. You know, a lot of big acts, uh, Wynton Marsalis, a lot of bigger name people that I grew up listening to, they were starting to call me for work after that for recordings. <laughs> projects came about. I did the uh, Hidden Beach label stuff, uh, the Unwrapped volumes, uh, one through five, I think I did, out of seven. Uh, and yeah, I've just had a lot of opportunities. I feel very blessed about that. I had no idea I'd be playing violin for 38 years. Uh, after and taking you don't it up, look it. Oh, thank don't you. Don't look it. Well, you know, I took it up in the public school system. I'm, I'm, I'm only stressing how important it is to keep the arts in the public schools because that's how I learned to play. It wasn't a, a, my parents pushing me mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. It was something I fell into. It was kind of a divine order in my life that uh, I even ended up playing violin. And uh, my first choice as an elective was home economics. My mother said, choose something else. So I took orchestra, not knowing what that meant, I just did it, because she said I couldn't take what I wanted to take, and here it is, all these years later, I'm still playing with two how, kids. How, and <laughs> yeah. that's amazing, that's a feat in and of itself. Yeah. How is it that you got to the electric violin as opposed to acoustic? What, well, you what, know, it, it was kind of an evolution because, well, first of all, in the beginning of my playing, I found it very difficult to play with a rhythm section without the amplification I needed. So there was a, a process and an evolution of developing different pickups until, uh, and then that turned into electric violins uh, with the pickups built into them. So it just gave you a means like an electric guitar just to be heard a lot better than if, if you didn't have one. And uh, they gotten so much better with it now to where I just I just have a pickup on my favorite acoustic violin and that's what I use most of the time and I also endorse another company Yamaha strings has a yes, great yes. electric violin that I play uh, very often I, I play that violin it is red yes it is a red instrument I thought I saw your case was red too. yeah my case is red <laughs> yes it is the lady in red now um, I know that you performed in 1990, I want to say, the world tour was Soul to Soul. I sure did. Wow. That, yeah, that was my first major tour. I was so excited. And everything that I did prior to that prepared me for that because you had to dance and play at the same time with that group. And so, and then that was my first time encountering black folk with British accents. 
So when they, I, I can't do any of them anymore, but some of the things they said was so interesting to me, just the way they came out in their own kind of Ebonic slang and twist on their English. That was just, a, that was the most phenomenal thing about that to me, that, uh, was that, and just the fact that I played salsa and Cuban music for all the years prior to that, so that when that gig came, I could dance and play at the same time. It was quite a feat just getting all that coordinated That's amazing. with your feet. Yes. You know, the other two girls that were with them, they already knew this stuff all the time. So it, I was just trying to fit in. But it was a wonderful tour. We went to Japan, went to Australia, then we did the U.S. And, and they finished up in England. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you have no specific genre, really, that you stay in. You no, can skip I, about Yeah, so I, I well. try to play with whatever genre I think I can fit into, and it's just fun to me. It increases my vocabulary as yeah. a musician, so I have, I have a lot to choose from when I do play any specific music that uh, involves improvising. I just have a, a wide vocabulary that I've adapted over the years from playing with different musicians, hearing uh, recordings of different musicians, seeing a lot of musicians play. My father is a saxophone player. His father is a trumpet player, okay. was a trumpet player. And, uh, you know, I picked up music from everything, from church, from playing with salsa bands, Caribbean groups. I've played uh, rock bands, you know, jazz groups, fusion groups, uh, R&B, hip hop. Wu Tang Clan. <laughs> it's been so many, and when I look back, it's been very fascinating. The, the, the journey I've taken as a violinist, very unique. I won't ask you a taboo question about who's your favorite to perform with, but I oh, will ask hard. perhaps <laughs> what has been your favorite performance overall, like experience-wise. Hmm. Well, there was one that I did in Bulgaria some years ago. Uh, that was actually before, right before Soul to Soul. In fact, I think I came straight from Bulgaria and then went with them. Wow. And uh, that was interesting. It was Eastern Europe, uh, someplace I'd never even thought about going, and the wall had just come down uh, oh, wow. in that part of yeah. the world. And so I played with a symphonic orchestra with a musician, a pianist from there named Milcho Levia. And uh, this was with an orchestra. That was like my first time kind of marrying jazz to classical music. I was allowed to use some of my own arrangements. And that was fascinating. You know, the orchestra didn't understand improvisation, but they had some gypsy musicians there. Really? I mean, I mean, really, while we were on the road, I, I stopped the band because I saw the bear on the chain tied to the tree. And these musicians, they didn't know they were playing jazz, but they were improvising and they were really, really good. And I was just fascinated by how improvisation uh, takes form in different parts of the world culturally, the kind of scales right. they use and you know the kind of tonality they use in their own music. And, and so I picked up a, a lot of uh, cultural learning experiences with different people from all of my travels. And that was the first time, so that really stood out for me. It all really is, it interlaces, right? Yes, so it's a tapestry. Yes. Yes. Now, how do you, how do you, um, perhaps maybe see the difference between a studio like you know performance uh, where you're recording versus mm -hmm. live and how does that evolve? Ooh. Oh well it's very very different I think in the studio you have to play much more carefully because every little eh, you know is gonna come across right, on right. the recording whereas live you are, you're performing you're moving you're dancing you're smiling you're engaging and exchanging with an audience uh, studio, it's similar, but, but there's not the big audience. It's just a, another energy altogether where you're really shooting for the perfection and the sound of what you're doing because you know that's what's going to go out eventually. Mm -hmm.